I've been a data scientist for about two and a half years now, and that was my first job out of college. So for those of you who may not know me, I'm Priya, and I graduated from UChicago about two and a half years ago, and I majored in physics. So data science is the field that I ended up in, and let me tell you, there's so much you need to know about data science because not every data scientist at every company has the same role. The roles and responsibilities are so different. I've worked in essentially three different roles now, and now I work for a tech startup that was acquired by Uber. So I've seen so many different things when it comes to data science. So I'm gonna go into all of my roles, responsibilities, the projects I worked on, and just like the exact details. So if you're a data scientist in the field already, this might help you a lot just to compare, to see what else is out there, as well as if you're trying to break into the field, because I just have a bachelor's of science in physics and I never got a master's in CS or any computer science degree. So this might help you as well. Let's get straight into it. So some quick background, I worked at Neil Nielsen. Nielsen is a very large, very large data company. They have like over five or 600 data scientists, 40,000 employees worldwide. I was there for two years. And the last couple of months I've been at Drizzly, which is a really, really cool tech startup that I am so excited to be a part of. And they're under the Uber umbrella. I essentially had two different roles at Nielsen. So I'm gonna talk about everything there and all the projects I started from because I kind of came from a background in physics where in astrophysics, computational astrophysics, I did have to learn a lot of Python. I took a class on Ruby and we did work on some machine learning models, classifying between stars and galaxies, neural networks. So I did have some sort of background, but it wasn't entirely what I was taught in school. When I got my first job as a data scientist at Nielsen, my first six months, it was a lot of research. So because I had a physics background, it makes sense that they put me straight into a slightly research driven analytical role. So I had to devise an algorithm to figure out when something got knocked over near the TV. Nielsen a company that does TV ratings and they essentially in about 40,000 homes install a meter in the homes to monitor what they're watching and that helps create the TV ratings and that meter is really important to us. Data quality is important. We need to make sure we're catching everything and sometimes the meter gets knocked over. We need to know that even though we're all the way back in the offices. So that's an algorithm I worked on where we actually did have accelerometer data, the XYZ axis of the meter and that data was in our storage but we never really used it. So my role was to kind of create a plan around how to actually create that algorithm, utilize it, deploy it. So that was my first role and something very similar with another algorithm to try to fix the meter. So I worked on those two things and it was a lot of Python and a lot of like testing. So I'd have to knock the meter over, calculate the angle and the back end. And I had a Python algorithm that I wrote that would calculate everything the way I wanted to. It pulled everything from the right tables once they were updated at I think three or 6 a.m. every day. And it was very interesting work like I really like data science where there's an application that is widely used like this is important and this was going to be in all 40,000 Nielsen panel homes. It felt like a great amount of responsibility for my first job and everything worked out. It, it got deployed into production but it was mostly just Python I would say and Jupyter Notebooks. Very like slight SQL of course you need to know SQL to pull data from all of the production tables in any company. Going into the next six months at Nielsen I worked for the big data team so they work with a massive neural network and they're in charge of keeping that in production and they also work with Comcast and other providers like Comcast and that's called working with return path data. So this team was actually entirely on Databricks. Databricks is this awesome platform where it's essentially like a Jupyter notebook but much faster because the underlying infrastructure is Spark. So you would code in PySpark or you could just code in Python. They're essentially like almost the same thing. It's like a different syntax like slightly but that team worked on Databricks Databricks and pulled everything in through AWS servers. So it was more efficient, very streamlined, and it's really interesting in large companies, different teams have different tech stacks. Like maybe that was just at Nielsen because it was such a large company with like dozens and dozens of data science teams. But that was a great opportunity because I got to work with creating an automated dashboard on Databricks for Comcast. Cause we had a couple of monthly reports that we sent them where we had to compare their data to our internal data to make sure everything lined up to make sure their data quality is top notch and they were essentially our clients. So people were running monthly reports, but it was actually very manual. So I worked on automating all of that. So that was all again, Python and PySpark using Databricks. And I automated that dashboard that took about like, I'd say a month, month and a half. My next project was creating a pipeline to diagnose issues in the Comcast data. Cause sometimes there's so much data and we don't have time to like manually look through it or just SQL through it. So it was a machine learning pipeline using a gradient boosting algorithm just to diagnose 
diagnose and pinpoint issues in the data pretty quickly. If there were any issues in the data, it would point at the right feature or the right column where the issue was occurring. So I could dig into that instead of kind of digging into everything to find out what the discrepancy is. So that was really fun. And that was my first machine learning style work that I did at Nielsen outside of computational astrophysics in college. So that was really interesting. And like, you can actually get a lot done using just the basic models. And of course, understanding the underlying math or how like the random forest trees work and what the difference between random forest and gradient boosting is and how they work in the back end is really important just so you know what models you should even test with. But you don't need to have the most complicated model ever for a lot of business problems. Like that's what I've noticed my last two and a half years. It does not need to be complicated. It needs to be statistically sound and it needs to answer your question in a correct and accurate way. But it doesn't have to be super hyper tuned, super complicated. So just wanted to throw that out there, but that was my next six months. So that's about a year working at Nielsen. Just a quick interjection to remind you to smash that like button if this is a value at all. And if this isn't, please let me know down in the comments what I could be doing better. Thanks so much. The next year at Nielsen was essentially like be still being a data scientist. And then I got promoted to senior data scientist back on the first team I talked about where we worked with the algorithms for the actual meter hardware equipment. This is where I had more of like a stronger role because I wanted to go back to that team full time and stay there at Nielsen because I really enjoyed the work and the research and I, I saw so much potential. And those projects, there was one which was essentially a market test. So this is where experimental design comes in where a senior data scientist designed an experiment using two different meters, our old one and the new one. And we tested it out in some markets and held other markets out. So it was essentially an AB test. We wanted to prove statistically that our newer meter model worked better than the other meter model. And we needed to get those statistically sound numbers before we can actually deploy this meter to all markets because it's very expensive doing things like that. There are a lot of resources dedicated to that. So that was one thing I worked on that was mainly in Python and a lot of SQL. And this was a ridiculous amount of just writing Python scripts and querying data to make sure all of the data quality was intact. And there's so many different sections of the organization where the data lived. So there was a lot of data engineering involved. I just connected to everything on dBeaver or DB Visualizer. And that's how I could kind of like visualize all of the data and see what I was even looking at and get data locations. But it was a lot of just talking to different people to figure out where the data was. And this might not be an issue at smaller companies. That's what I did for a lot of it, as well as just automating a lot of Python scripts. And I just coded everything out in Jupyter and Spider, which are two IDs I really like. But now I use Atom. Then I started realizing after working with the data so much after that project, the AB test design experimentation project, I started realizing that all the algorithms that we create essentially is almost like anomaly detection. Anytime there's an issue in the home, we wanted to know. And we had like 15 to 20 different algorithms, right? All unique algorithms. So I was like, oh, maybe maybe we can automate this, create a very large machine learning model that can detect anomalies in the home and can pinpoint where the anomaly is occurring. So this was really fun. I did a lot of research into unsupervised and supervised machine learning algorithms. We did some tests. We actually did find promising results. This was a pretty large project. And this was around when I got promoted to senior data scientist. So me and a lead data scientist started working on this and it was actually very, very interesting work. And it was such a big project to overhaul these existing algorithms that data science has never overhauled. Like this has been there for about like a decade and it was very like legacy software. We live in a different day and age where everything should be a lot smarter and a lot more automated. So that was my goal with this. And that's about when I left Nielsen and that's the larger project that we ended on. That role was all Python and a lot of data engineering as well as researching different machine learning models unsupervised and supervised. I think the most promising at the time was principal component analysis analysis, PCA, which is, it's just, it works for everything. <laughs> it's, it's such a great model. And then of course, lots of testing on gradient boosting algorithms, random forest, and then like, you know, the hype ones like XG boost. Moving on to my role at the new company, the tech startup, it's been absolutely amazing so far. Tech stack is really, really good. Things weren't really sporadic. Different orgs don't own different parts of the data, like data science owns everything. And we have the ability to edit all of it, like all of the production tables and reporting tables and everything. So that's what I really wanted. And that's half the reason I moved companies. I think the pay was more than fair also, but I joined as a data scientist and
and so far I've been here about like two and a half, three months. And what I realized biggest things with the projects I've worked on, again, like I said, the most complicated machine learning model isn't always like the best use of time and resources. Sometimes if you could get to the answer like 90% of the way, you would want to do that. Over spending an extra like two, three months hyper tuning something really complicated and building a custom model that you might not need in all cases. Of course, we have a lot of custom model building in the company, but only for things where we want to have that as a product within the company and not just like a couple of one-time analyses. So what I realized is that it's really important to figure out what your time constraints are, especially at a startup where there are only like, you know, five, six data scientists. But I worked on a forecasting model. So that was a lot of time series machine learning. The tech stack is really great and it's on Databricks. So that's something I was very familiar with. So there was a lot of time series modeling, research into different time series methodologies that would work for our use case at the time for that forecasting. And another thing I've been working on a lot is really perfecting SQL. I didn't know this, but SQL is really, really, really important in the tech world. Honestly, like data science involves a lot of SQL. It involves a lot of Python. And of course, sometimes it involves R, C++, different languages, but I'm primarily used to just programming in Python. So pulling data in SQL, but not doing crazy manipulations in SQL, not just window functions, but like, you know, like hundreds and hundreds of lines of queries. I wasn't used to that in my previous role, but that's something I've really developed so far. At this new company, because there are only a few data scientists, each data scientist kind of owns a different part of what they do at the company. And I'm on the partnership side where I actually work directly with those who speak with like all of our biggest clients and Drizzly being under Uber, we're still wholly operated by ourselves. So my team works with all of the big alcohol suppliers. So like Bacardi, Tito's, all of those brands. And I get to work with exact business cases. And I'm essentially a data scientist specifically working on solving all of the business issues and business cases and like upselling products that we're selling to our clients, things like that. It's very easy to measure what I'm doing. Like revenue wise, I can see what I could potentially bring into the company. My work isn't as abstract. So I really love what I'm doing right now, mostly Python SQL. And of course, like tech stacks using like DBT. DBT is an absolutely great way to take care of your own data. And that's the data engineering side of it, where we can actually edit DBT models, throw them into production production and then open it up in Snowflake. So all the products I've worked on so far, there was time series, a lot of SQL, a lot of uh, data visualization, a lot of figuring out what we could do to existing products to get as much insight as we can from the data, because that's my role. It's to try to like use our data to make ourselves invaluable to all of the clients, understanding what your projects are going to do to drive business decisions and understanding business logic so that you can further propose projects that are going to help your company, not just like revenue wise, but just to become a more valuable data driven company. All of that's really important to remember too. So that's what my third role is essentially like. I absolutely love it so far. Made the right move moving here. Great. So that was essentially my entire history in data science. So if you have any questions, feel free to let me know down below. I hope this helped somewhere. Or the other gave you an idea of what a data scientist does, and I will see you guys at my next video.